was taking a class on basically social networks and social media. And the point of the class was to go viral. So I was posting every day. I had to create a brand new TikTok account and I didn't know what to post about. And my professor was like, make it about your cemetery internship. The trend is more that gravestones are getting a lot more personalized and more reflective of who the person was. recipe like she did not share it with people today on heritage hunters we are joined by rosie grant rosie is a tiktok influencer you can follow her on tiktok at ghostly archives she's been featured on cbs news npr and today thank you for being here rosie Rosie Grant, and I'm from Washington, D.C., now living in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. You're on the West Coast. That's nice. Really, very recently, West Coast transplant. I had to back this up with my mother has some very definitive ideas about what I choose to do <laughs> with genealogy. And I'll give you an example. When I talked to my mother about genealogy, she says, I don't care about all those dead people. We were down visiting with my family for the holiday. And my mother was actually the one who said, hey, I read this article about you, Rosie, and that she makes recipes from these gravestones. And I said to Hope, a great idea for the podcast. I love that. So I would love to hear how you got started in finding these. What was your inspiration for this? And I want to hear some of your favorite ones that you found. I love that your mom was the connect. That's incredible. <laughs> I just finished in library science school at the University of Maryland, studying library and archives. And so that was really the origin of all of this. I was interning, we had to do an internship in an archive of some sort. So I interned in the archives of Congressional Cemetery in D.C. Cemeteries have just really cool archives, and they have an archivist there who's just this like amazing storyteller. And while I was doing the internship, I also was taking, so it's like library, archives, and information science is like the third part of the degree. So I was taking a class on basically social networks and social media. And the point of the class was to go viral. So I was posting every day. I had to create a brand new TikTok account. And I didn't know what to post about. And my professor was like, make it about your cemetery internship. And I was like, is there an audience for that? And she was like, yes, there's an audience for everything, including cemeteries. And it turns out there's a huge audience. <laughs> for three months, I had to post a video every single day for this class. So I posted about my internship and different graves that we had. And this is how I eventually heard about the gravestone recipe of a Brooklyn grave, which very far away from us. Some people are like, oh, so DC must be full of these. DC doesn't have, as far as I know, doesn't have any recipe gravestones. But um, this woman who's Naomi Miller Dawson, this woman has this gorgeous like spritz cookie on her gravestone. And I saw it on Atlas Obscura and I was like the pandemic a year ago, we were still at home and quarantining. So I'd been learning how to cook. And so I decided to cook it and I put it on TikTok and everything exploded from there. And then when I was learning more about Naomi and her grave, I learned that there was other women who had done this around the US. So that kind of just started this journey. We've seen the memes on Facebook that say, I told you you could have this recipe for my dead body and then the recipe would be there. But I had never seen until I read the article that people had done this. So how many people do you estimate might have put their recipes on graves? What are your thoughts on that? 
It's not super common. So some people, when we've talked about it, they've been like, oh, so this is like a trend. And I don't know if necessarily you would say it's a trend because the families that I've talked to, or even there's one woman who's still alive um, that put a recipe on her gravestone that she will eventually be buried at. No one seemed aware that there were other ones out there. So it seems, if anything, the trend is more that gravestones are getting a lot more personalized and more reflective of who the person was and like it's more than like a name and a date and maybe like a spiritual quote that it used to be and I've come across 17 technically around the world now most of them are in the U.S. most of them are women there's one guy and two in Israel so those are and there might be more out there that might be it I have no idea <laughs> so not super common I've mapped them all out so they span from literally no Alaska to Brooklyn New York they run the map that's amazing like that, it's really cool. I have seen, Hope, I think you told me about this, that people will put a QR code on the gravestone yes. now. So I can read an article about that. Yeah. Like you could incorporate that, the favorite recipes yeah. into that. You can send it to the family blog. You can literally, it's so fun to see the weird, weird is such a relative term. Literally anything goes. So QR codes, if they go to a website about the person, like it's such small real estate on a tombstone. And if you want to have a little bit more details about the person, also it's cheaper to do it that way. If you put too much text, you're paying by this, like every single letter that's carved out. So that's, that is like a cost-effective way to do it. I want to, I'm not even sure what I want done with me, but I want my, I want a stone that's got like my entire family tree on it. I've spent all this time working on it. it best and that's going to cost you a fortune. It's not going to cost me a dime. It's going to cost the kids. There you gonna, go. But maybe what I should do also is put on grandma's butter cookie recipe. Oh, your grandmother has a butter cookie oh. recipe? So there's this butter cookie recipe that's been passed down from my second great grandma who came yeah. from Germany to all through the family. And uh, like I met up with some second cousins, I don't know, maybe about a year and a half ago. And she had the recipe that had been passed on from my second great grandma down to her descendants and all. Everybody's got this recipe, which is great because cookies are to die for. <laughs> so, my God, incredible. Literally. <laughs> You can take it to the grave. That's one of the coolest part about us is like talking to people and like the conversations about what would be on my gravestone. Is there a recipe I'm known for? Or like people's grandmothers or mothers or fathers or whatever. Like food is such a, it's so personal. Like it's so many senses and it is such an interesting thing about like, like almost being fed by the dead of we're getting <laughs> food from like someone who's passed on, but like we're still being like all of the senses get connected to when we make their dish. It's so cool. It's amazing that you have that recipe. <laughs> so what's your favorite recipe that you've found so far on the stones? Gosh, I, they've all been good. Like they, they've all been baked good. For the most part, most of them have been baked goods, which are excellent. The one that I've been making the most often is the snickerdoodle cookies from the grave of a woman named Annabelle. She's buried near San Francisco, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, in California. And it makes so many cookies. So it's like really good for a party. I had snickerdoodles when I was a little kid. So it's like a very sentimental. And even I did this like Australian broadcast and the Australians seemed very tickled by the word snickerdoodle. They're like, snickerdoodle, what's that? <laughs> and I never thought it's a very fun word to say. And then also Naomi's her, of course, her gravestone, which is just, it's so beautiful. It's like an open cookbook, the spritz cookie recipe. And that one was like, such a process for me too. Cause like, I just made it literally just based on the ingredients and I made it completely wrong. And everyone on TikTok was like, no, this is what a spritz cookie is. This is how my grandmother <laughs> makes it, a cookie press. <laughs> and so it's been like a journey to make them. And then now fast forward to, I've met the family and we've cooked it together, like learning wow. how we made it herself. And so I'm very, now that's such a, it's just such a special experience. So that's also very much a favorite cookie. That's amazing. And actually, I saw the recipe on there, and that's very similar to my grandma's butter cookies. Um, hers has a lot more flour in it. But yeah, and we had the cookie press. We always did it with the cookie press. Sometimes we'd add food coloring to make green trees and that kind of thing. Oh my God. But yeah. And we would just. On Thursday, January 12th, 2023, the McHenry County, Illinois Genealogy Society will be hosting Paula Stewart Warren, who is presenting 
Genealogical Goldmine, the Records of Old Settlers Organizations, please visit www.mcigs.org for additional information, registration, and membership. My mother was making the cookies today. As a matter of fact, they live down in Georgia, my mom and my sister. That's and I know so that they cool. make cookies today. Yeah. So it's really exciting. I was just, when I read the article, I was blown away. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> it's such a cool idea. Naomi herself was very interesting. She was from Barbados, first generation, her and her sister is in New York City. And so like the, however, she got connected to the spritz cookie recipe. We think that she read it in maybe like a newspaper or something, but it was a secret recipe. Like she did not share it with people. Like she would make the cookies and her son actually has this story. He brought the cookies into like the office one day and everyone was like, this is the best cookie I've ever eaten. And spritz cookies are amazing. And uh, she wouldn't share it. She would not share the recipe. When he asked for it, he's, oh, my coworkers really want this. She's not sharing it. (laughs) So she literally (laughs) took it to the grave. And then it really was like towards the end of her life when they were talking about like stones and memorials, her son was like, I feel like we should put your cookie recipe on the gravestone. And she eventually agreed. So it was with her blessing. But yeah, like literally at the end of her life is when she gave the recipe. What fun. Yeah, oh, right. Funny. And I'm sure some people, because like they, if they didn't have somebody to pass it down and something like your grandmother's cookie, um, oh, there's nobody to pass it down to, but maybe there's another generation after that may want it. Let's put it on the gravestone cool. at least so it doesn't die out. Yeah, that's right? such a good point. Do you guys have any like lost things that you're like, oh, I wish we'd asked this? Because I feel like that's my family right now. Both of my grandmothers died during the pandemic. And of course, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Like they both passed away. And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I'd asked them, like, how did they make these things? Like one of my grandmothers made like this lobster recipe every single year and none of us wrote it down. So we'd it's probably like for all, like she loved Julia Child. So I'm like, it was probably some version of a Julia Child recipe, but I don't know. So yeah, it's just like things, these things are so precious. But yeah, they definitely are. Have you, have you thought about maybe writing a book with the recipes that you found and pictures of the tombstones or? Yeah, for sure. So I have been contacted by uh, a few interested parties in this. I think the biggest thing for me would of course be like getting buy-in from the families. Like this all started out of a homework assignment. (laughs) So I feel like I've been mostly just reacting to things and it's been like very exciting and fun and family members have reached out. And like now at this point, I'm getting sent recipes from people being like, you should try this and like permission, like blessings to, to try these different dishes. But I think if I were to do TikTok feels very like silly and ephemeral versus like a book, I would want to meet with all of them. And then ideally even learn how the person made the recipe themselves. I'm assuming for a bunch of these that have limited instructions that I'm doing it wrong. And so if I could get it like, and get details about their lives, like I'm basically just going off of find a grave and obituaries else about them. I think that would be very cool to put together. Have you thought about doing your own genealogy? I did. Yeah. So my, during my archives classes, actually, we, I took a genealogy class and it was like one of the best experiences. So I'm guessing you guys are both, obviously you've done the homework and it is a never ending paper trail. Like you just, you think you found it all and there's another layer every single time. Yeah. Even for me. So I did my classes with someone from the Maryland state archives And what I loved is she had us start the class by handwriting our genealogy, like as far as we knew. And I was like, oh, I'm like pretty familiar with my family, but she's try to get names, try to get birthdays, try to get locations, like just handwrite it the first time. And I was like working on it for like hours and scratching my head being like, I think this is, I think this person was from the, I think this was my uncle. And I had no idea how many gaps I had. And so actually, thanks to that class, I ended up interviewing my grandmother a week before she died. We talked for hours and I didn't know this was going to be the last time I ever talked to her, but like she was in like full form. She was like remembering everything. And then she died a week later. And we have this four hour interview of family history, family drama. So I'm like, everyone should take a genealogy class because <laughs> you don't know what it, what might be the last time you get to get these details. Absolutely. And you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. 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 Do you guys feel like for yourselves in your work, is there like particular family histories or trees that you're going down right now? 
so easy. Oh, is it? <laughs> it, it never, it, it just, it never ends. Just recently, I had seen that Finding Your Roots show with Henry mm-hmm. Louis Gates, that they were taking non-celebrities as applicants. And I put in an application because I have this brick wall. It's on my mom's side. It's a Polish, my second great grandfather, he's 100% Polish. I think he was in the witness protection program because he just pops in a marriage record and then in a, and then he's gone. I can't find anything more on him. I don't know. The only clue I have is on one of the Polish websites was there was somebody with a similar name where it said alias and then another Polish surname. Now, on my DNA matches, I have some of that Polish surname. Mm. I don't have any of this other name. So I'm wondering if that's the same kind of situation. But he had to come from somewhere, right? So. I figured, what the heck, I'll throw my hat in the ring, see what happens. But I'm always trying to knock down that brick wall because it's irksome, quite frankly. <laughs> that is so fascinating. <laughs> figure it out. It's a um, detective story about it. It's so cool. <laughs> it, it really is. It's really neat. And I was delighted. My dad did ask me when we were down visiting them. We were just down over the holiday. And he did say to me, so how far back have you gotten on my family? And I was like, well, on this one branch, we're back to 1780. On this other branch, we're back this far. And, and then so what I did for Christmas, I can't release this before Christmas in case he hears it. But what I did for <laughs> Christmas, I had done a little book on the one branch of the family for my cousin when she came to visit. And so I ordered him a copy of that book and sent it to him for Christmas. So oh hopefully. Oh my gosh, that is life. such a gift. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Sorry, we're being photobombed by patches. <laughs> by patches. Yeah, no, that's so cool. I felt like it was just that time to like, it was almost like it felt like like cleaning, a spring cleaning of there was just things that I hadn't realized were so disconnected. And like, I had a grandfather who my grandma actually thinks is adopted and it wasn't clear in the family, but similar things of people in his family all had different names and there was no real explanation for it. And so it wasn't even that far back. And so I had no idea. Like I'd never heard this before. She even had the name of the church and the orphanage she thought he came from and stuff like that. And I was like, holy cow. Like we never, no, none of us have ever talked about this before. That's crazy. And yeah, I don't know. Genealogy is so cool. (laughs) It really is. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a never ending mystery novel, isn't it? Oh yeah. (laughs) You never know what you're finding in the next page. No, definitely (laughs) not. In a pure life, like you're like, oh, this is why I am the way I don't think I'll ever figure out why I am the way I am. <laughs> but forever mystery. Oh, Join Heritage Hunters on Sunday, January 8th, 2023 at 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Twitter for Breakfast and Brick Walls. This month's guest with a brick wall is Linda Slate. Please email the number two heritage.hunters at gmail.com to get the Twitter Spaces link to tune in and participate. We hope to see you there. My mother blames everything on the fact that the, my mom and dad's lines meet up like hundreds of years ago. One line comes down from the first wife, one line from the second wife. So every time we're out anywhere, she's, yeah, my daughter did this family tree and found out we're related. That just explains my kids. That's amazing. Oh my God, that was a couple hundred years ago, but. The drama of it is very funny. (laughs) I had, um, so I had a weird find the other day. My cousin Sue, she said something like early October about she really doesn't know much about her family. So I thought for Christmas, I'd beef up her family tree and mail it to her. No big deal just do a little bit of research. So she's on my dad's side, right? She's on my dad's German side. I find out that part of her family lived down in Bridesburg, near where my mom's family came from, with one of the same surnames. So I'm like, Sue, it's Joseph. Did you ever have Joseph Murphy who, you know, he lived up in, in Yardley because that's where the descendants live. And she's no, but my great grandfather George, he uh, came here by came here alone from Ireland, and, and I'm like, 
the dudes live in two doors down from where the Mur- where the other Murphys lived in written so I'm like, is it possible we're related on both sides of my family tree <laughs> but I'm back far enough we're all related right but yeah that was wait I know this name I know this street like what's going on here whoa so. connection city that is so cool yeah. So it should, yeah, it should be interesting. So back to the recipe. Sorry, we got off on a tangent there. Are you kidding? This um, is so, I have so many follow-up questions, but okay. <laughs> for oh, later. Awesome, awesome. One of the things I'd like to do is try to find like some of the traditional Polish recipes and try out some of those. I only know how to make one or two things that are Polish. Dang, that sounds good. So what follow-up questions do you have? I'm sorry. Oh, follow questions. Even for you guys doing your genealogy research, like I feel like that's been for me, like the most interesting part of it is just realizing like archives that are the most helpful. Like I use a finder grave for pretty much everything. Ancestry, obviously for our genealogy purposes are incredible. Do you guys have any favorite archives or tools that like have been really meaningful in you guys' own research? We live in a really great area where we're set in the middle of these wonderful archives. So on one side of us, we've got Philadelphia. We have the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. We've got the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. And then not, then not even two hours away, we've got the State Archives in Harrisburg. Then on the other side of us, we have the Trenton, I'm sorry, the New Jersey Archives right over in Trenton, New Jersey, which is about a 10 minute drive for us. And then we also have really good representation. We've got two family history centers in Bucks County, And then we have one family history center down in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which isn't too far of a drive for us either. So we're really in this ideal spot of of where the American Revolution began. So we're really lucky in that fashion. So if I had to choose a favorite out of all of them, I think that I would probably go with the New Jersey archives because it's easy to, it's so easy to get to and easy to access the information. Um, HSP historical society of Pennsylvania is absolutely wonderful. They're in this beautiful old building. We did a, we had, there was some sort of genealogy fair going on that we managed to snag a table at and we were, so it's on two floors, right? It's an old Philadelphia building. It's on two stories. Oh we're at the top of the stairs. We're at the landing of the stairs it's that led. It, pretty much. Nobody was missing us because if they were going upstairs, they were passing wow. us. So that was really great. But they've got some great, they have tons of great information. And of course, more and more things are becoming available online. So I can't overlook that either. Yeah. But there's nothing like going to to the archives and seeing and touching the papers. Well, not touching them. We all know we're not allowed to do that. But, you know, seeing the documents. Looking very closely. Documents. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that we have really close by to us in Northeast Philly is a branch of the National Archives. So oh, I when, when I say we live in a good area for this, we, yeah. we really do. At the end of you the know. rainbow. Like, this is everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the National right. Archives has some of my family because they uh, um, some of my family, when they settled, they grew up in Philadelphia. What? <laughs> you can go to the, you can go to NARA and get your own family. <laughs> wow. That's so Isn't cool. that amazing? Yeah. We did have something so, to, like we, like my mom was applying for Irish citizenship. My grandmother's from Ireland and we, we were similar. Like they had some paperwork that she needed. I think it was like a marriage certificate, which I was like, why would they have this? But I guess it was some sort of larger record keeping. So she got this birth. No, she got this marriage certificate from them, which I was like, all right, national archives, get us that Irish citizenship. (laughs) We love our paperwork. And again, we've, so a lot of my family's from Philadelphia, settled in Philadelphia before moving out to the burbs. So a lot of my stuff is just down in Philly and that's easy access to get to. And I just find it also interesting. We've got all these different places we can look. So they're in local cemeteries, they're in local churches. Oh my and God, to me, yeah. it's just really amazing to see all of that. So yeah. hope, yeah. what about okay. you? I felt similar. Oh, first here, I'll let you talk first and then I'll go. Oh, nice. Okay. Just, just the, the National Archives is where I've had the most luck. I got my grandfather's citizenship papers when he came over from Ireland. 
Oh, you did too. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Like his naturalization papers and everything came from there. That's so cool. Was it difficult to like access that when you were looking? Not at the time. And then they disappear. Someone yeah. doesn't file them back right. And they're like, they say no. they should be here. <laughs> Oh my God. That's like my worst nightmare of helping someone try to find something. And you're like, it's not in the system. What do we do? And then you go someplace and it's, oh, I don't think any of my family is going to be in this area. And then it's like, you're just finding all this stuff after all this stuff and after all this stuff. And it's like, we didn't bring enough quarters for all these copies. <laughs> We're running out of 10 cents. You have credit card machines, I hear. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> that's, I think that's how they should be doing it. I think that they should be cashless and you should just pay with a card. It's getting, getting with the times. And with the times, yeah. I mean, it's so funny to even to see, like, yeah, NARA and like Library of Congress, like their archives are so, it's funny because it feels like, so, if to me, I was going in as like a new person being like, it feels so like antiquated and it's just like a paper pusher, like going through a Dewey Decimal System to find the right whatever folder, let alone like the huge cataloging that they have to do and like these amazing, insane digitization projects. Like, I would read the scale and I'm like, this is like a billion dollar project. I don't even know how to comprehend this. It's definitely, like I said, there's no, there's no comparing being able to walk into an archive and find, mm-hmm. find something that, it, that is important to you. Yeah. You know, it's just been sitting there waiting for you to come find it. Oh, oh my gosh. That clue to your own family. Yes, exactly. That was like a big crest so at the cemetery. We would like the main request that we would get for information and archival questions, things like that was just family members. But every once in a while, there would be people who would be doing a story on like locals. We had this, we had Rebecca Roberts, who's Koki Roberts's daughter from NPR, the former spokesperson. Her daughter is a, like a, I think it was like women and gender historian. And so she had done all of this research on all these women that were like big civil rights activists that were buried in the cemetery. And so she would go through the archives and had these insane stories and like newspaper editions and like record keeping from all these places in DC. And so eventually that ended up in the archives. And so when people would ask questions about Lockwood and people like that, who were like big names in these very like niche categories, like the cemetery archives had all of that, which was so cool. On Monday, January 23rd, 2023, the Genealogical Society of Bergen County will be hosting Go Paperless, Digitizing Your Genealogical Research, presented by Melissa Johnson. Advances in technology have made it possible for researchers to organize their work and make it accessible from anywhere. Learn the techniques and practices for organizing and digitizing your work, as well as how to use cloud storage, scanning software, scanners, apps, metadata, tagging, and more. Please visit www.njgsbc.org for additional information, registration, and membership. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I always tell Dave, keeps me off the streets and out of trouble. So. <laughs> exactly that Rosie what a great hobby you have I absolutely love it if you decide that you're going to put together a book I want you to please come back on the show I would love and to thank you so much for having come. me oh anytime yeah anytime you want to gab about genealogy we're here <laughs> oh literally yeah I was like I feel like you so I fairly so rarely meet other people who get excited about this topic so this is such a joy thank you <laughs> We started yeah, the club since you. our family hates all of it. <laughs> I know. We Someone's need some friends that get excited with us. Yeah. I've seen even some of our friends, their eyes glaze over when we start talking <laughs> genealogy. So, you know. Oh, yeah. That's me with the cemetery. So I hear you. I was interviewing. We were interviewing. I think you were with me. I think it was the McKeesport Historical Society. And they do this thing with their cemetery where they have docents learn about some of the people in the cemetery and then they do ghost walks through the cemetery in the month of October and the people will be dressed in the period garb and be able to give the bio a short bio of the people's stones that they're passing and I was like that is such a cool idea it's so fun <laughs> Congressional does one of those. They have like local actors and they have these like huge binders that they memorize 
that's just about one person. And so you go on like a guided tour and you just come across people who are like being the, per and you can ask them questions about their lives. And they're like one, they have some more salacious ones. So this one family that unfortunately was involved with a murder and it was like a murder of passion. And so it's like the husband and wife, like still arguing as like these like representations and like, they have all of these facts about them. It is so cool <laughs> to see these things. Right. I told, I told the people down in Hemeville, I'm like, you guys should totally do that with Beachwood Cemetery. That would be <gasps> a really good money maker. Sell little tickets to it and stuff. And I yeah. would totally cheer for that. That would <laughs> be fun. Cemeteries have to do that. There's so much taboo with, there's so much taboo around cemeteries in general of people being like, the main like negative comment I'll get on TikTok is you shouldn't even be there. And I'm like, I, we're on different pages of disagreement on such a different level, just because I feel like, yeah, cemeteries, not only from funding, like a lot of cemeteries don't have regular funding. Like if you're waiting for people right. to die, it's not enough to preserve most of the gravestones and do like upkeep right. and stuff. And so I feel like the ones that are like connecting to the local community, whether it's offering tour congressionals considered like the kookiest of them all because it does all of these tours they do they have an apiary so they have beekeeping honey that they sell they have a dog walking program so you have to pay to walk your dog in the cemetery and that's like their biggest revenue source and it helps keep the cemetery like real like they have a preservation it's now because of it so like for some people who are like i hate that i don't like it but on the opposite side sometimes is like the abandoned derelict cemetery because there's no money to keep it up yep Yep. Yeah, keep it alive. And that's keep it alive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and preserve the history and the people. Yeah. So aside from recipes, have you seen any other remarkable stones that have stuck out in your memory? Gosh, there's just so many cool gravestones out there. I feel like Atlas Obscura is like the best for just unusual. That was how I even heard about gravestone recipes to begin with. Like in congressional alone, they had, like there was a librarian of Congress and he has a call number to a book and you can look up the book. And it was like a book that was important to him. And it doesn't say the book on his gravestone. You have to look it up, which I think is really cool. And like, yeah, I don't know. Even another thing in congressional that's been cool to see that's become a thing is they, the claim is that they are the first LGBTQ corner like cemetery. And this was particularly like People who had identified in that community had sometimes been barred from being like buried in particular cemeteries. And so Leonard Matlovich, who was a very big civil rights activist, he's buried there. And it started this trend now of all of these other people who have different sexual identities being buried there as well, which is the idea is like they have this kind of community and death that they might not have had in life per se. This is a lot of these people died in the 90s, unfortunately. And so that's been a very cool thing to see. And it gets just very cool visitors who are going through DC anyways. Lots of dog related ones. There's so many like dog <laughs> and cat related ones. One just says, I heart cats on it, which I think is so cute. <laughs> so those have been some of the recent ones, specifically I can them all that I love. <laughs> when I was in Scotland in, what year was that? 88? You know, after we graduated. I got to Scotland for a couple of weeks with my mom and my sister, and we were at Stirling Castle. And it, when you stand at one point of Stirling Castle and you look down, is literally a pet cemetery. So not only do they have everything else at Stirling Castle, but this one little pet cemetery area. And I was like, and I had never seen a pet cemetery. So of course, I was very interested in that. So it just makes me laugh to think that there really are such things around it. I've, I've never seen one in person other than that one. Cemetery. If you go yeah. to DC, there's one, it's like, a, they call themselves like the national pet cemetery. And there's a couple of weirdly famous animals that are buried there. Like dogs that were featured on TV shows are buried okay. there. Um, right. Former FBI director Hoover, his dog, who he, they say he loved more than anyone else in his life. So his dog is buried there. And there's a monkey that's buried there as well. So if you want like wow. a pet cemetery and it's very beautiful, there's lots of St. Francis of Assisi everywhere. I think that was like mm -hmm. patron saint of animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> People love their animals. There you go. When we're rich and famous, Cody's <laughs> going to have to go in a pet cemetery. <laughs> There you go. Next to your whole family genealogy tree. There you go. <laughs> Have his own little one over the side. <laughs> yeah. If you guys ever come to Los Angeles, I would love to give you all a tour of one of our. Oh, absolutely. Black absolutely. Year. Like Hollywood Forever is the most, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. They have like 
cats living on it. They have 40 cats that live on the premises that have a vet. They have their own food, like they're taken care of. They have several peacocks that live there as well. Just, I love peacocks. Oh my gosh, you would have, okay, then you'll love the cemetery. <laughs> it's very kooky. <laughs> All right, that's a deal, Rosie, for sure. All right, listen, it was wonderful to talk to you. I'm gonna let you get back to your evening. And thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. And like I said, open invitation whenever you want. Yeah, I will definitely take you up on it. It was lovely talking to you both. Absolutely. Me too, Rosie. Thank you too. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, good thank night. You. From Friday, February 24th through Sunday, February 26, 2023, the New Jersey Family History Institute is hosting their 2023 virtual conference. There will be three full days of sessions on genealogical sources and methods designed to help you boost your research skills. Presenters include Blaine Bettinger, Cindy Ingle, and Judy Russell, to name a few. Please visit www dot new jersey family history dot com for additional information and registration Thank you for joining us today on Heritage Hunters. This has been a CNC production recorded and mixed by me, Barbara May. We would like to thank our guests for sharing their genealogical experiences and personal stories. Be sure to visit us on our webpage, heritage-hunters.com, and our many social media pages such as Facebook, Twitter, Locals, and more. Please leave us a review, like our page, and follow us to be sure to never miss our show. If you'd like to be on the show or have an idea for an upcoming episode, please email us at 2heritage.hunters at gmail.com. And that's the number 2, heritage.hunters at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Remember to like and subscribe to our podcast. We hope you'll join us next month on Heritage Hunters. This has been a CNC production.